I repeat to you, gentlemen, that your inquisition is fruitless. Detain me here forever if you will. Confine me or execute me if you must have a victim to propitiate the illusion you call justice. But I can say no more than I've already said. Everything that I can remember I have told with perfect candor. Nothing has been distorted or concealed, and if anything remains vague, it is only because of the dark cloud which has come over my mind. The cloud and the nebulous nature of the horrors which brought it upon me. Oh, so scary, those horrors. It is scary. That is a genius first sentence, I think. It gives you a feel that we've been in this room for hours, that there's other men here, that they're questioning. It's got an immediate sense of place and time. I, Chad, I feel like that there is somebody else in the, in the room with us. Really? You do? I do. Who? That would be me, Chad. <gasps> <Yeah. laughs> Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a third uh, host of the podcast this week. Woo! Welcome, Andrew. Hello there. Andrew Lee? Uh, good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Andrew has stepped down off of his uh, mighty voiceover pedestal <laughs> and joined us plebs as we discuss. Uh... It's quite a magical transformation, I believe. <laughs> so, this week, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. Oh, and I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Andrew Lehman. There we are. And we are discussing the statement of Randolph Carter. That's right, here on the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPinecraft.com. So, so anyway, yeah. the story you were saying in the beginning. I was saying that I really like that first sentence. I like the whole first paragraph. I think it's neat. We know our fellow's recounting something. Uh, clearly, it was something that disturbed him. And some dark cloud has come over his mind so that the horrors of the thing that he's recounting, he, he can't tell exactly. Well, what we do know, it is about his friend, his good friend, Harley Warren. Yes. I, again, I say I do not know what has become of Harley Warren, though I think, almost hope, that he is in peaceful oblivion if there be anywhere so blessed a thing. It is true that for five years I've been his closest friend and a partial share in his terrible researches into the unknown. I will not deny, though my memory is uncertain and indistinct, that this witness of yours may have seen us together, as he says, on the Gainesville Pike, walking towards Big Cypress Swamp at half past eleven on that awful night. That we bore electric lanterns, spades, and a curious coil of wire with attached instruments, I will affirm. For all of these things played a part in the single hideous scene which remains burned into my shaken recollection. But of what followed and of the reason I was found alone and dazed on the edge of the swamp the next morning, I must insist I know nothing save what I have told you over and over again. So it seems like uh, our main character, Randolph Carter... Uh, is talking about something that happened between with him and Harley, where they had some kind of adventure. Yeah, adventure. Well, I mean, they've got equipment. They've got lanterns, spades, coil of water, uh, w- water, coil of wire, a, co- <laughs> a, coil, a coil, coil of water. It's a water park. It was an adventure. That- Yay! <laughs> <laughs> when they go into the tomb, it's down a water slide. It's Wait, you know, yeah, he, hilarious. A great oh man, theme parks you could build if you only had the money. Love crafting, love crafting theme, theme parks. Don't think we haven't thought about it because <laughs> we have. I'm sure you have. Rotting wharf land and the uh, the theme areas would be under, oh, the mad goodness. scientist laboratory, the mm-hmm. caverns of doom, the Pla- you, plateau of Lang. You would have so the plateau of Lang. That would be great. Snow cones. Mm. I don't know if you'd room. have a lot of repeat business, though. Yeah, there's just a room they all squeeze you into, and you sit there with a wax model of Lovecraft and feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so, wh- Harley Warren, what's up with this guy? We know that he didn't return from whatever this adventure was. They worked together on some sort of arcane studies. Lots of old, crazy books, and, and Warren did take a special book with him in his pocket when they went on this adventure that Randolph didn't quite ever understand. Yeah, well, there was this, yeah, this book that, that he had received, some ancient text written in a language that he doesn't understand. Yeah, came to him from India. Didn't even from, recognize. Didn't even recognize. Not only couldn't understand it, he didn't even see it before. And so Randolph goes on to admit that he was somewhat cowed into a lot of research he wasn't necessarily comfortable with by Harley. Oh, yeah, he said he was intimidated by Harley and that, mm-hmm. that he was just kind of an overbearing sort of person and, and Randolph was a little meek. Yes. Kind of uh, easily put in his place, so to speak. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night before that awful happening when he talked so incessantly of his theory why certain corpses never decay but rest firm and fat in their tombs for a thousand years. But I do not fear him now, for I suspect that he has known horrors beyond my ken. Now I fear for him. Pretty ominous. Yeah, pretty ominous. What, what is this theory exactly? <laughs> 
He talks about his theory, but he never explains it in the story. Yeah, Warren never explains it either. He doesn't explain it because he's afraid that it's going to blow Carter's mind, right? Well, yeah. that's what he says, is why he, he, he constantly puts Carter off by saying, you wouldn't get it, you're too nervous to hear the all the details, it would drive you crazy. I can know it, but you're too either stupid or frightened or something to get yeah. it. Yeah, some friend. Too yeah. sensitive. You're too sensitive, yeah. <laughs> he's looking a, out for a, him. A bundle of nerves. Yeah. They're down on the uh, Gainesville Pike what it says there and Gainesville uh, is Florida it's in Florida somewhere Mm -hmm. so I always pictured it as New England no no Harley Warren was a southerner Harley Warren was a southerner and Randolph Carter stayed with Warren for like seven years I think how do we know this about these two characters um, it's mentioned actually in, in, in another story in which Carter is a central character, uh, The Silver Key. And The Silver Key sort of um, summarizes Carter's curriculum vitae or mm-hmm. whatever uh-huh. you want to call it. Uh, and it doesn't mention Warren by name, but it refers to a seven-year period where Carter went to stay with a, a man in the South and they shared researches for seven years and at the end of that seven years they went into a cemetery and only one of them returned. Oh, oh my goodness. So, you know, it has to be Warren even though uh, Warren is never named. But okay, it, it, so it did, cool. But it, it did occur in the South. So this, uh, this story is actually setting up some characters that are going to, oh, yes. going to recur in other Lovecraft stories. Well, Randolph Carter is, is pops up quite a few times. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's... I think he's the most frequently reappearing like normal human being character yeah. oh, yeah. in oh, any wow. in Lovecraft's For sure. this picture. is Lovecraft's Jack Ryan this is Lovecraft's Jack it, it is it's Lovecraft <laughs> it Jack Ryan especially that story where he found the Nazi submarine <laughs> so then well Randall's having a hard time because he doesn't really know what they actually did that night witnesses saw them walking with a bunch of gear as we said uh, he only remembers the scene where they ended up. That's where his memory sort of starts. The place was an ancient cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of immemorial years. It was in a deep, damp hollow, overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence of centuries. They start digging around in this swampy cemetery. As you, you've located in Florida, I think that that's the, the feel that it has. It's a wet place. It's a, yeah, Cypress, it's an overgrown Lots place. of Spanish moss hanging uh-huh. out yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Sort of sickening, uh, over, over uh, hydrogenated vegetation. They uncover three giant stone slabs in the ground. And uh, Warren makes a few calculations, and then they decide to pry the lid off of one of them. They, they do this, and of course a terrible stench emerges Yes, noise and yeah. vapors, I believe is what they were. Yeah. I love to get that kind of visceral detail. <laughs> it's that part in the horror movie when one guy turns and throws up. Nobody else has a problem with it, but they pick the weakest guy in the gang, and he's the one that turns and throws up. Uh, after the smell has dissipated, they approach. And now, for the first time, my memory records verbal discourse. Warren addressing me at length in his mellow tenor voice, a voice singularly unperturbed by our awesome surroundings. I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface, he said, but it would be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you've read and what I've told you, the things I shall have to see and do. It's fiendish work, Carter, and I doubt if any man without ironclad sensibilities could ever see it through and come up alive and sane. Frank's going to get to do some character. Though. Well, I was going to say, it's supposed to be a mellow tenor, so I was, I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface, but... <laughs> So, yeah, this is, Harley's plan is he's going to go down in the tomb mm-hmm. and Carter's going to stand up there and they're going to talk on the phone. Yeah. To just so that Carter's not afraid to be by himself. It's so polite of him, yeah. too, the way so that nice. he Yeah, well thought out. I mean, because that telephone gear, that's a lot of wire. If yeah. you're going to go to the center of the earth and back, that's a lot of wire. <laughs> so Warren knew from the very beginning that he wasn't going to let Carter go down into the thing right. yeah. and brought him along. Right. So he really just brought Carter to, you know, help move the damn stone. Yeah. What a, what That's a true. Jerk. What, a, what a jerk. <laughs> what a jerk. He's totally that friend you call when you're moving. <laughs> Remember that time we hung out ten years ago? I yeah. have some arcane research I need to do. Someone needs to haul my wire. Well, so uh, so Warren unreels the telephone wire, and he quite bravely descends down the stairs, covered with goop and yeah. stuff and the stench and. Yeah, it's it's pretty nasty. It's a it's a, it's a frightening prospect. Yeah, it gets pretty creepy for poor Open Randolph because he's alone up there yeah. now. In the lone silence of that hoary and deserted city of the dead, my mind conceived the most ghastly fantasies and illusions, and the grotesque shrines and monoliths seemed to assume a hideous personality, a half sentience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Carter's being a little wimpy here. You do? Yeah, I do. 
So if you were alone in the cemetery at night and your buddy had just descended into it, and you were the only two people who'd been there forever, I would yeah. I would rather be the guy on the on the, waiting on the outside than the guy going in. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, the guy who's on the inside, he at least is in control of the situation because he knows what he's doing. That's yeah. true. You know, he's true. the guy who's sitting out waiting. All you can yeah. do is sit and wait, and that's yeah. murder. Man. Whistle. Right. That is and terrible. you don't, yeah, you don't, and he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't understand why Warren's gone down. He has right. no idea when or if he's ever coming out again. Yeah. I, got, I think I was being a little hard. And you start to hallucinate right. when you're in a cemetery at night. Oh yeah, That's I can, true. I can tell you that from yeah. personal experience. Me too. As can I. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I've seen some really creepy things in the cemetery at night, yeah. and I'm pretty sure they were my imagination, or at least that's what I tell myself. So he is sitting there for a while, probably starting to hallucinate a bit, and then he starts to hear some sounds from the phone. Then a faint clicking came from the instrument, and I called down to my friend in a tense voice. Apprehensive as I was, I was nevertheless unprepared for the words which came up from that uncanny vault, in accents more alarmed and quivering than any I had heard before from Harley Warren. He who had so calmly left me a little while previously, now called from below in a shaky whisper more portentous than the loudest shriek. If you could see what I'm seeing. I could not answer. Speechless, I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. Carter, it's... It's terrible. Monstrous. Unbelievable. Yeah, oof. Randolph keeps asking questions, but nothing's coming back. No, he's not telling him anything, except that I can't tell you what I'm, what I'm seeing and yeah, what's going too, on it's here. too terrible. It's too terrible. Yeah. This is just like when somebody, you know, says to you, You know, I had a... Ah, forget it. <laughs> and he's, what? 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 What is it? Starts driving you crazy. It's like that, except horrifying. And happening right now at the other end of the wire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, then, finally, he hears, Carter, for the love of God, put back this lab and get out of this if you can. Quick, leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say. Don't ask me to explain. Yeah, I just, think he's learned his lesson by now. He's not going to ask him anything because right. he's not going to tell him squat. Yeah, but he does keep asking. He does keep asking. He does keep asking. Well, I think it's that, you know, someone telling you to do something and... You, why? Well, well, but it's also what he's telling him to do is, you know... Seal him up in a grave. Seal him up in a grave and run yeah. for his life. And yeah. it's like, I came here to help you and you're asking me to basically bury you alive. And it's, right. that runs counter to... Yeah, that's not cool. Yeah. No. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Well, uh, then suddenly Warren from Below breaks into song. Beat it! Put back the slab and beat it, Carter! <laughs> <laughs> Just that, beat it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would be great. <laughs> Actually, something about Warren uh, reverting back into what he says is his boyish slang. Boyish slang, yeah. Yeah, lets Randolph know that this is serious. <laughs> but it also, it also is what gives... Uh, Carter, the spine, all of a sudden to say, no, wait a minute, let me help you. I will come down there yeah, and I right. will help you. It's like, that's what galvanizes Carter almost into action. Yeah. <laughs> almost. <laughs> well, yes, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll warn says back to him, it's nearly over now. Don't make it harder. Cover up those damn steps and run for your life. You're losing time. So long, Carter. Won't see you again. Then he gets really revved up on the end. Trust these hellish things! Legions! My god, beat it! Beat it! Beat it! So, yeah, basically, Warren is gets attacked by a lot of things, and uh, he they seem to be giving him enough time to say a lot before they Yeah, it's amazing that he does manage to hold on to the phone and keep yeah. describing all this while he's being well, attacked by the thing. Well, so what do you think is going on down there? Because clearly he's like fending them off with just the one hand right. while he's holding the phone to his ear with the other hand, which is, he might have he might have made it out if he dropped the damn phone. We never, we'll never like know. like some spoiled brat in the mall who just won't put her phone out of her ear. What, what? I'm trying to ring something up. Well, uh, so Randolph sits there for a long time calling into the chasm. Yeah. Eventually. And nothing. Nothing. And then. And then. Shall I say that the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, inhuman, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience and is the end of my story. I heard it and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in that unknown cemetery in the hollow amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapors. 
heard it well up from the innermost depths of that damnable open sepulchre as I watched amorphous necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon. And this is what it said. You fool. Warren is dead. And that's the end of the story. And that, that is the end. The end of the story. So the, um, this monster speaks English. Well, we don't know that. I think the working theory is not that it's a monster, but it's the guy whose tomb it is, who is in fact still alive. Oh. Uh, this is supposedly the tomb of a very great wizard who's been buried down there for quite some time. And, and Warren's theory is all about how some corpses never decay, that right. they right. wax firm and fat in their tomb for a thousand years. So I think the, my, my take has always been the implication is that the guy who says you fool Warren is dead is not a monster. He's, he's oh. the occupant of the grave oh. who probably has, Robert. has his legions of, of hellish minions down there doing whatever it is that they do down there. And when, when uh, Harley Warren shows up, they he six his minions on Harley All Warren. Right. We do know from Return of the Living Dead that the minute a zombie gets a phone, he becomes instantly clever. There's that part where he says, "Send more paramedics, send more cops." I uh, I just always assumed that they were uh, like it was a, a Warren of ghouls, like it was some ghouls that lived down in there. And, and ghouls that's... meaning uh, could be later on in Lovecraft's uh, story that they make a bit more of a prominent. Appearance. Appearance. But uh, they're basically subterranean, humanoid, kind of dog person creatures that feed on the bodies of the dead. And they have a whole society. They have, yeah, an elaborate culture, yeah. actually, with linguistics all their own and everything. And, and, and another, a character from another Lovecraft story, uh, Pikmin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, becomes a ghoul. Yes. Uh, so a, a human being can turn into a ghoul. Which but... would make sense why it spoke. English. If ah. if it is in if fact is some in fact former human now ghoul or some ghoul who learned English from a human that it you know all possibilities. I like Andrew sure. Sure, well the yeah. because there is that clue dropped when he, he says what the studies are about, yeah. which mm -hmm. is the preservation yeah. of these bodies. Yeah, his 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 unspecified theory about the persistence of life even after apparent death. And that's a little similar to uh, uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. This has got a little bit mm -hmm. of that going on too, where there's you know dead sorcerers and I mean not that yeah. his body's preserved or anything like that because it's not. But well, there they're looking at their essential salts, right? Their, yes, yeah. uh, their ashes, their things. ashes and things. Well, we, I, I was curious what these experiences in the cemetery were when you hallucinated different things. <laughs> if they were hallucinations, if they were in fact hallucinations. Indeed. Well, I remember one time uh, it was with you, uh, Chad. And uh, Josh Bentley, yeah. a good friend of ours, and we were just kind of in trouble out in the, in the cemetery back in Moline, Illinois. Yeah, well, you know, it's a small town. There wasn't a lot going on, and, and so we used to just kind of haunt the Riverside Cemetery out there. Yeah, a lot of people would go out there no to reason. Ma no ma reason, make really. a point. <laughs> no, it was like kind of a make-out point, so we would, yeah. we would often terrorize people that would go... Because it was so peaceful, or what? Well, so we'd go to the cemetery, and we'd wait around, and pretty soon some people would pull up to make out or drink or do whatever, and then we'd frighten them, which I think is kind of what But was it... Came. I mean, was it because it was a cemetery, or was it like a beautiful park, it and was that's both. why you would go? It's a it very both. beautiful cemetery on You get a hills. view over, over the river. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's, yeah, it's nice, but um, not, not for those people. Not for those poor people <laughs> whom we terrorized. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we weren't vandals or anything like that. We never no. damaged anything. But, uh, you just know, psyches. just kind of <laughs> throw rocks. Which and... you continue to do to this day. That's right. <laughs> throw like little pebbles at their windshield and they, you know, try and figure yeah. out what's going on and then just kind of make creepy noises. And It was eventually... great to see. It was these, like Scooby-Doo like... happening. It, it kind of was like that. But it, it was, was... Oh, I, I, I say nine out of the ten times it was a couple making out, the guy would abandon the woman immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so many times we'd scare them, and the guy would just go. That's because he, he'd heard of the Zodiac Killer, and <laughs> <laughs> he thought yes. you were him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in retrospect, I mean, they probably did literally fear for their lives. Right, right. right. But we... but so while we were out there goofing around, sometimes maybe we'd get scared ourselves. Oh yeah, of course. Your brain's thinking about you know ghouls and creatures and ghosts, throwing and pebbles and... and throwing pebbles. <laughs> well, I remember seeing. Uh, 
we were standing there looking, and I think it was probably just headlights hitting the, the cemetery. But I was like, look, look, the, those gravestones are glowing. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, and they were. <laughs> They're getting more luminescent, and then it's fading away. Yeah. Let's get out of here. You know, something <laughs> terrible's happening. Yeah, I remember that. that Driving, was that's what was happening. Yeah, somebody's car lights were, yeah. you know, hitting them, but they were so far away that we couldn't see the, them doing anything but reflect off of the, the tombstones. And did the tombstones have your names engraved on them? Oh, oh that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I remember one time that there was, we saw, it was a black shape with arms of, of flying, you know, flying about wildly. And uh, and we ran, we ran out of the, the park, or, or the, out of the cemetery. And these other kids saw us running out, and then they went in, and a few minutes later, they came running out. <laughs> Do you remember this? Was it a bag? It was a, yeah. a pole. It was a bag. Oh, awesome! It was caught on a bush, and it was in the wind, and it looked yeah. like you know these arms, and it made this noise, which our brains had twisted into being like, <laughs> right. like that. But it was rustling plastic. That's sure. all it was. Sure. Worst part of that story: approximate age of all parties involved was like twenty. Yeah, we, we were, really should have known better. We were pretty old. <laughs> no, it was more like eighteen. Right, that makes a difference. Yeah, we were. I think we're still teenagers, I hope. But Andrew, you uh, had said that yeah. you, you had seen some kind of creepy things at the cemetery. Oh, yeah, but that wasn't a hallucination. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so backing up for a minute, you guys like this story? I do. Oh, my God, yeah. This is, um, this, in my opinion, is the first of the true, when I think of a Lovecraft story, hmm. this feels like this is when he first really steps into it. It's got the old books. It's got, like, you know, trying to uncover secrets and, you know, sanity-blasting things and, and death. And, this, is and definitely, this is definitely classic Lovecraft mode, um, and it introduces a character, Randolph Carter, who will appear several other times mm -hmm. and expand on Lovecraft's universe. My only objection to it as a story is that it's not a story. It's an episode. It's a brief description of a thing that happened, but it's not yeah. a story in the sense there's no plot or arc or anything like that no. so it's it's a lovely piece of writing but i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it's a story mm. right in 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 it being just that episode it seems almost dreamlike would that perhaps have something to do with the origin of the story it would have something to do with the origin of this uh, story because it is in fact inspired by a dream mm. well let me as were as were many of lovecraft's almost yeah, every stuff. single one of his stories seems to be inspired by a dream but let me uh before i go into into that it, the story was written in december of 1919 uh, but wasn't published until May of 1920 in The Vagrant. But it wasn't... Which for Lovecraft is a really short turnaround time. That's, yeah, yeah. that's not bad. Because a lot of his stories weren't published until decades later. Yeah, and, some of the know, ones we've talked about not yeah, until were after never. His, yeah, yeah never after he died. Or, or, yeah. Yeah. But he had a dream, and this is actually a recreation of that dream. And he talks about it in a letter to uh, a Gallimo. It was a dream about him and Samuel Loveman who is a, a friend of his. Hmm. You had a friend of, named Loveman? I know, Love, Captain Loveman. Love that is a wrecking crew. Which is pretty awesome. And Loveman actually had this extensive library, and Lovecraft often thought that there was all these secrets. And, you know, like, I think in his mind, he really kind of exaggerated the importance of this library and liked to think that there were all these arcane secrets and things like that. This is a dream where they go to a cemetery and Loveman says things, you know, like, you know, you wouldn't understand it. I can't explain it to you. Like, mm -hmm. all of those things. And one of the really sad things, you know, the part in the story where he says, you know, you're... You're too weak of, uh, you know, uh, of conscious. What would he say again? Yeah, you, you don't have the constitution for this. Yeah, you don't have the constitution basically. for it. This is a quote from Lovecraft's letter and what he actually dreamt about and what was said to him. At any rate, this is no place for anybody who can't pass an army physical examination. Ouch. Oh. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. And that's his old sort of shame that he wasn't able to. Yeah, uh, he wasn't. He didn't pass the examination because Lovecraft tried to get into the National Guard uh -huh. uh, and didn't pass the exam. Yeah. And this was a dream. You know, so obviously, I mean, this story is... I but think, that's quite... what Loveman said in the dream. Loveman didn't ever say that. No, so no, Lovecraft he never, in real he never life. really no. said that, yeah. no. Because that would be really rude. That would be really rude. <laughs> yeah. But in his dream, Loveman says that to him. Yeah, so that's Lovecraft's own guilt talking to oh, him. Oh, yeah. 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 And I think it kind of says a lot about his relationship with Loveman, like their friendship. Mm -hmm. Like, I think probably he thinks he's a little domineering and... Well, the relationship between the relationship between Warren and Carter is, you know, who knows what psycho dynamics are going on in that relationship. I mean, he describes Warren as saying he always dominated me and sometimes I feared him. And yet he sticks with him for like seven years, yeah. sharing his researches, but only up to the point where Warren will let him in on stuff. Uh -huh. Warren is sitting there reading books in languages that Carter doesn't even understand or recognize. Right. He's totally dependent on on Warren for 
you know, what are we doing and why are yeah. we going into the cemetery? Right. And no, don't just do what I tell you. And here's the phone. And, 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 and you know, so it's, um, Loveman, if I'm, if I'm correct and I'm, I may be wrong, but I think I'm right in saying that Loveman was Lovecraft's only gay friend. Oh. Um, and Lovecraft was, you know, sort of, he hated everyone. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he, I think he was just as homophobic as he was racist, but he oh. was also just like he hated Jews, but married, but married Sonia right. Green. He hated gays, but Loveman was his gay friend. And I oh. don't know whether, you know, the sort of self-conflicted dynamics of his relationship with Loveman, who's the inspiration for Harley Warren, right. mm -hmm. may have something to do with the nature of the relationship between Warren and Carter and this sense of, you know, it's what, what are these two single men doing living together for seven years and, and reading creepy yeah. old books? Uh, you know, wow. and then, so I don't know. I'm, yeah, no, I didn't I, know. Maybe I'm making a lot more of it out, <laughs> a, lot, a lot more out of it yeah, than there really needs to be, but that is a thing. Samuel Loveman was openly, well, not openly, but. I, I know, I think he was in fact pretty openly gay. I mean, certainly for the time, I think he was, wow. I, 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 and I think it's one of those things where everybody just, you know, agreed to pretend it wasn't there. Right, right. Yeah. But I don't think Loveman, you know, made too much of a stink about effort it. to uh, hide the fact, huh. but at the same time. Uh, anyway, that's my understanding, and like I said, I could be dead wrong, but I believe that is the situation. I, I hear a lot of people off, or, you know, sometimes talk about whether Lovecraft was gay or not, like closeted. Yeah. And he obviously did, he had an issue with his mother, and he, he had a very short-lived marriage, which didn't seem to go very well. And spent the rest of his time uh, apparently alone. Alone. Uh, but nothing in his writing or his letters ever really indicated that that he had any kind of conflict about his sexuality or anything like that, right? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, nothing that he committed to paper. No, no. Uh, there's there's no real reason to think that he was. Yeah, It's no. just the absence of any mention to the contrary right. is mm -hmm. what leads to the speculation. But there's no real reason to think that he was gay. No. I mean, it is kind of irrelevant. I it's mean, utterly irrelevant, yeah, but yeah, it's... Yeah. But there's, I mean, when when somebody's romantic life is a mystery, people will Absolutely. make exactly. up details to suit themselves. Whatever is whatever is uh, <laughs> interesting. Well, and I believe Randolph Carter appears in a number of other stories from other writers. Oh yeah, other writers. Oh yeah, yeah. Pick I know that in that first them. collection of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen comics, I think it's the first collection they have a story in the end mm -hmm. of it. The protagonist is Randolph Carter. I, I, and I think partly the reason other writers have glommed on to Randolph Carter is because he's pretty transparently a stand-in for H.P. Right. Lovecraft himself. Yeah. You know, Randolph Carter is just an alter ego for H.P. Right. Lovecraft. Right. Now, I know that there are a number of, of short film adaptations of this story. It's very filmable. Uh, you know, it's got a nice framing device. It's got dialogue. It's That's the thing. I, I, another thing I was about to say is that this is, as I recall, this is one of the earliest stories where Lovecraft uses, you know, dialogue to any degree. This oh, is, yeah, absolutely. It features people actually speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. It's almost shocking in a way because his writing style is so antiquated when the characters start speaking and you realize they're speaking in somewhat of a modern yeah, dialogue I mean, it, it, saying beat it yeah it yeah. jumps out it's of like, the page. Wow. it's almost laughable in a way but at the same time it is it does have the desired effect of being oh my god this guy's really in trouble you know yeah. it's really right. it's really frightening i think that might be one reason why it has appealed to numerous filmmakers mm. because it, there's quotable dialogue in it yes absolutely well, what what other i know of of the one the one prominent one that uh, sticks out in my mind is the testimony of randolph carter right. Directed, never and written by Andrew Lehman. Oh, that! <laughs> but what right. else has uh, what else has been? Uh, well, there's like I said, there's a number of short films out there that people have oh, adapted this, and a lot of them I haven't seen. I know that Randolph Carter as a character is in The Unnameable, which is a horror oh, right, movie yes. from the, the late. Unnameable Two is called the the, the statement, statement of, of Randolph, Randolph Carter. Carter. Yeah, but Randolph Carter is actually in The Unnameable, which is a story by H.P. Lovecraft. Right, right. That's so, another story. And yeah, those two, the Unnameable films. Uh, Bear little resemblance. Bear little resemblance to what the original story is. Right. I, I actually like those movies as straight up slasher kind of fun. Horror films. Good monster in them and, and that sort of thing. But not, as as usual, not Not Lovecraftian, really. The, no, no, no. In, not in at any all. any stretch of the imagination. No. Uh, but The Testimony of Randolph Carter. When did you guys make that? You know, it's funny because I was looking at it again recently <laughs> for no particular reason. <laughs> and... Uh, astonished by the fact that we made that movie 22 years Whoa. ago. Whoa! Wow. We, we shot that movie in 1987. Um, it was a college project. You guys, and, uh, yeah, it was, Sean looks very young in there. Sean it's, looks very young in really there. It's really surprising. It's, they, we all look really young in there, yeah. It was a long... Cause, uh, he looks young because it was a long-ass time ago. It was 22 who, who years you, ago. Who are you guys talking about? Sean Branny. Sean Branny. It my, feels uh, like I, I've heard him during this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
What were you shooting with? <laughs> 1986. We were shooting on VHS mm-hmm. uh, video tape on a home <laughs> deck that weighed like 80 pounds, nice. and we had to tote everywhere. Right. Uh, great big ass camera. Uh-huh. Um, and it, then did you have to edit with the two decks? We edited it on an incredibly linear twin tape deck system. Yeah, and one of the go. reasons, you know, uh, the movie is long, horribly, horribly long and slow. <laughs> I know that. Everybody knows that. One of the reasons, and I'm not going to defend that, but I will explain that one of the several reasons why it's long and slow is that we were editing on a linear twin tape deck system where once you've made an editing decision, yeah, that's you, it. You're you stuck with it. Go you back, cannot right? go back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Ah, the other, the other really good film adaptation of the statement around of Carter that comes to my mind is it's part of Out of Mind, which is a brilliantly good Canadian film. Yeah, which which cross cuts between a, sort of a recreation of Lovecraft himself talking as, as you know, and they film it in the style of like a 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's Lovecraft sitting in front of a microphone talking about his own work. And then it intercuts between that and a, a, a modern day Carter Warren story mm-hmm. where uh, and, and at the end of the movie, the modern day Carter encounters Lovecraft himself. Hmm. And it's a very it's actually kind of a touching I'm touched right now. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, Tears. a, a touching um imaginary encounter of Lovecraft encountering his own alter ego out in some nebulous dreamlike condition is brilliantly well made. And, and I have to see that. I haven't, that you haven't seen it? You haven't seen it out of mind. It's, oh, right. Right. Chad, it's really good. You've got to watch out of mind. It is a great, great thing. Watch it with me, folks. <laughs> yeah, you must all, you we'll must all immediately, you must oh, all yeah, immediately we'll go get out of mind. Sure. Sure. It's great. So let's talk quickly about uh, the new project. What do you get? What, what are you working on right now? A whisperer in Darkness. The Whisperer in Darkness. After uh, The Call of Cthulhu, which we made about, oh God, four years ago, we are now working on the next uh, mythoscopic film adaptation. That's correct. And uh, we're doing The Whisperer in Darkness. Sean and I have, uh, we're working on the script for, uh, we've been hammering that out for a long time, a couple years. And uh, finally, earlier this year, we, we settled on a draft that we both are quite happy with. And um, we are now... Up to our eyeballs in pre-production. Mm-hmm. Cameras roll about one month from yesterday, I think. We start shooting in Vermont on September 22nd. Oh, that's very yeah. exciting. That's um, very exciting. We have the first read-through with the full cast tomorrow night. Yeah. Oh, so this isn't a silent movie. This, time. this is a talkie. We are uh, we are setting this one like we did for Call of Cthulhu. We're setting this one in the year in which it was written, which is 1931. And in 1931, sound had come to the movie, so we are doing this one with uh, spoken dialogue. Nice. Uh, it's still going to be black and white. It's still going to be in mythoscope, but it will have uh, all talking, all dancing, all singing. Uh, and who is directing this film? Sean Branny, my my Sean Branny. cohort Again, colleague. Again, for some arms. reason, I feel like he's... I feel he's... like I've heard that guy's voice today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shall I say that the voice was deep? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our reader today has been Sean Branny. Sean Branny. <laughs> well, that's all I've got. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's going to wrap up uh, this week's show. I want to thank Andrew for uh, joining us. Thank and, you so much. My yeah, pleasure, it's so Tyler. awesome. Thanks and, for having me. And also, thank you so much for all of your readings that you do. Oh, and yeah. uh, look I'm forward sure to doing more. We're, yes. Oh, yes, you will be but doing more. I look forward to doing some that are not set in Dreamlands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nothing wrong with nothing wrong with nothing wrong with Dreamlands, but some of those names really sneak up on you. It's like, oh, what I the who, who? It is written on the brick cylinders of Cadetheron. God damn it. <laughs> Kadathron. That one took me by surprise. <laughs> so, uh, what are we what are we reading for next week? Next week is the terrible old man. Oh my goodness! What's that about? Do you think? Uh, I'm guessing it's about a fish that wears a fedora. I'm already terrified. It is. It does sound terrible when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we've got for today's show. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Andrew Lehman. And this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Here at HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. HP <laughs>